Now, of course, here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, it's, a, it's basically a repeat of what's found in Exodus 20. It's the Ten Commandments, right? Real, real common, real famous section of Scripture. Um, even people who don't know very much of anything about the Bible at all have at least heard about the Ten Commandments and can name a few of them. You know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. It's a real common, obviously. Um, but So we see here in Deuteronomy chapter number 5, the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to be honing in, I'm going to be focusing in on just one of those. And verse 16 says, Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, the Bible says, and this is a little bit out of order in my notes, but um, I just want to point this out real quick, because... In the New Testament, in the book of Ephesians, we're going to get back to this a little bit later. But in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2, the Bible, or in verse 1, says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So the Bible says this is the first commandment with promise. And what that means is, you know, there's, we have a lot of do's and don'ts in the Bible. And especially in the Ten Commandments, a lot of don'ts. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But this is the first commandment, it says, with promise. And the reason why it says with promise is because it says, Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. But why? He says, that thy days may be prolonged. And that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So he's saying, look, this, was, this commandment is something where if you do this, he's given you a promise that your days may be prolonged. Like you, I mean, you, you, know, you want to have length of days, you want to have a long life, you could start by honoring your father and your mother. Okay, and this is something that's a promise that's given in conjunction with the, with the law, with the commandment. Whereas the other one just say, hey, don't kill. You know, it doesn't say like, you're going to be blessed, you're going to get anything extra special about that. Just don't kill, don't do it. Um, but this one does, the first commandment with promise. Now go ahead and turn your Bibles to Mark chapter number 7. Now the Ten Commandments, they're, they're pretty short and simple. I mean, they're as short as thou shalt not kill, right? And, and some of these, they don't go into very much depth. But the statements themselves are very broad, and they, and they go very far-reaching into our lives. They have a lot of applications, and, and it's amazing how deep God's Word is and, and when He can just make these, these solid statements. See, He doesn't need to make you know, volumes and volumes and volumes of laws like we have in this country and in this state where you know, they just, I mean, every year they've got laws probably stacked at least this high just, just of new stuff of just, you can't do this, and you can't do this, and you can't do this. All these new laws are going into effect year after year after year. Overall, I mean, these aren't the only laws that God has, but, I mean, they're contained in this book. Okay? It's not that big. But what we need to do is also be able to recognize, you know, how they apply. For example, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about here. You know, the Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Right? Pretty simple. And on the surface, you say, well, yeah, of course, you can't just take something that doesn't belong to you. I mean, if it belongs to someone else, you take it, you're stealing. Right? But you have to be able to apply that in, in, in all facets to where, you know, stealing really is happening. See, a lot of times you want to trick yourself into thinking that it's not really stealing. So... An example of this might be, you know, you're on the clock, you're at work, and you're getting paid. And you're getting paid to do a specific job. Obviously, the boss hires you, wants to do some work. Maybe it's in front of a computer, and you're just like, well, then you start getting on Facebook. And you start doing everything else that's not related to the job. Now, that's stealing. You start doing it. Now, I understand, you know, your job might have a break time. And they designate, okay, you know, you get a 15-minute break, you get two 15-minute breaks, whatever, and you can do this thing, fine. That's not what I'm talking about, though, and you know it, and we all know that. There's people who, I mean, I know someone who slept on the job. I mean, just, just flat out, just fall, just, just sleeping. And it was a regular occurrence for that person. It was a, it was a shame. I, I, was, I was blown away the, the first time. I was just like, how in the world can someone even think about going to sleep at work? And, and, and it's ridiculous, but that's stealing. I mean, you're getting paid to do a job and you're not doing it. And see, this is what I mean by being able to apply God's word and being able to apply these laws. Because it's no less stealing than going up to someone and, and just taking something out of their hands that doesn't belong to you and just keeping it for yourself. They're both stealing, but we have to be able to recognize 
all the areas where, where that applies. And, um, and God doesn't have to spell out each individual circumstance individually to, to say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. It's all encompassed by a lot of real basic laws that he set forth. So, um, you know, it's important to remember, and that's why the Ten Commandments are real powerful, because there's a lot of things, I mean, idolatry, there's so many things this day, these days that, that can be considered idolatry, even though you don't necessarily have the graven image of an animal that you're, like, bowing down and worshiping. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of the commandments. Like, I'm not going to get into all the other commandments, but we need to be able to look at the Bible and be able to realize where these things pertain in our lives, because God's Word is timeless. These, you know, we need to learn from this throughout our personal, individual lives. And, um, you know, this commandment of honoring your father and mother is no different. Now, we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at it. And there's actually a couple of different meanings to that word honor that's given in the Bible. Um, the most common one is, is basically like respect, right? Honor your father and mother, respect. Have respect, have reverence, um, you know, give honor to someone. And... Um, Respect is something, in today's world, is lacking severely. Especially in the younger generation. It seems it's beginning, progressively getting worse and worse and worse as time goes on. There's just a, an utter and total lack of respect for, for people who are older, for just people in general. I mean, just, just having common courtesy and manners and, um, you know, politeness. There used to be a time when people actually used to have manners, and they used to teach manners, and there was, you know, rules of etiquette, and, and, and children growing up would learn these things, and it's basically just, how do you communicate with other people? How do you talk to them? How do you treat them? You know, a big one, and especially it's getting worse and worse these days, like I said, it's just a general respect for older people. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32, the Bible says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. That word hoary, it's used like hoary frost. It means just like white, you know, like white, gray-headed, a light color, basically an older person, right? Someone who's showing their age. It says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. Now, there was a day not that long ago when people used to, you know, older man stands up, you know, walks into a room, people would stand up, Right? It's a sign of respect. It's a sign of showing, you know, hey, here's an older man that's walking in. Let's give him respect. Let's stand up and just rise up before him. This is something that people now, it just, I mean, it's forgotten. It's totally forgotten. People don't, people don't even think about it anymore. Now, and now it's like to the point where people look at old people with disgust and disdain. And, and that's what's going to happen. This world continues to get more and more wicked. But see, this is something that's even written in the Bible, and it's one of those things, maybe you never noticed it before, and you never understood, why do people even, why do people do that? And people would stand up sometimes for a woman, right? I mean, you're sitting at dinner, maybe some guests show up a little bit late, and like one of the guests is a woman, well, the, the thing to do would be to stand up, pull out the chair for her, you know, let her sit down. That's, that's common courtesy, that's showing respect, and that's just showing politeness, and that's something that's missing in in today's society, and it's something that's severely lacking that, that ought to be repaired and ought to be fixed. And I think that one of the biggest reasons for this lack of respect is that, for one, it's just not being taught in the home. That's where it all has to start. Because you can't rely on the public school system to teach the kids this respect and this authority. You can't rely on anyone else to do it, ultimately. You have to rely on yourself, and the parents need to be doing this. But see, there, there's so many problems just get compounded and worse and worse, and, and they're all interrelated to many degrees. So what happens is when we don't have a stable family, when you don't have a stable family environment, then a lot of these things just, just go out the window. So what I'm talking about here is like in today's world, you know, we have a lot of divorce. We have a lot of families where the parents are splitting up. And now this changes the dynamic between the parents and the children. So, you know, there's a couple, you know, they're married, they have a few kids or whatever, and then they end up getting divorced. Well, now they have to deal with their relationship with the kids. And too many times, because of the divorce, the relationship starts turning into one of friendship instead of one as a mother or a father. Because now they're competing for the affection of their child because... 
Some of the time they're spending with mom and some of the time they're spending with dad. And then they start hearing, oh, well, mom got me this. So then dad's got to go out and, and, and spend some more money and do this. And it, and it just completely destroys the, the fabric of, of the family and, um, and how that child should be raised, not as a friend, not as someone that you need to buy over or win over their love, but as someone that you need to parent. Huge difference between a friendship or that type of a relationship and, and a, and a father-son or a you know, mother-son relationship. Completely different. Your role, you have a responsibility to raise that child right. And usually the way you raise that child is going to be by telling them no and by disciplining them and letting them know. I mean, obviously you have to love them and spend time with them and do great things, but, but it can't all just be that, that one-sided type of relationship. You have to have the, the discipline. You have to have the... Um, you know, that type of, of telling, just telling the kids no. And what happens is when you start having this type of friendship mentality, the respect level starts to go down. When you start giving kids just anything they want because maybe they start, and maybe it doesn't even have to do with divorce. Maybe it just has to do with a lazy parent that doesn't want to discipline their kids. The kid starts whining. The child starts complaining. And you start giving them, give them what they want. Just give them a shut up. Just give them what they want. Give them what they want. That child is not going to respect you because they're going to learn from an early age, hey, if I just do this, I'm going to get whatever I want. I'm just going to be a loud mouth. I'm just going to cry and complain and then I'll get whatever I want. And that just teaches an utter lack of respect that you ought to have for your parents. And the other thing that happens is this, you know, this stinking hell of vision that's brainwashing people into thinking that this is normal behavior. They show, I mean, all these TV shows are all about families, and they show families in the context of whatever it is, whatever, it is, whatever drama, TV show, whatever it is. They have all these families, and they sh they're, what they're doing is you're seeing how these people parent on the TV show, which is not reality, by the way. I mean, this is, these are TV shows. People come up with a story in their brain, and they just, and they write it out, and there's a script, and they act it out on the screen. It does not mean that that's reality. So they show you, hey, this is how people, and basically what it is, it's subconscious. You start seeing this over and over and over and over again, how they're raising their family. And you're giving you a look into, into someone else's life. And it's just what they want to show you. So they show you a life where the kids never get spanked. They never get disciplined. They get, you know, set down and I'm going to tell you what you did was wrong and that's it. And on the TV program, maybe that works because it's fake. Because it's an illusion, because it's not reality. Yet you continue to watch this stuff and it goes into your brain over and over and over again. It conditions you into thinking that, oh, well, hey, everybody's doing it this way. When it's just the, the, the lying TV that's doing it that way. The Bible says in Colossians 3.20, it says, Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Children need to be taught this respect. And it starts with the proper discipline. You have to start while they're young. Proverbs has many verses on how we ought to be disciplining and raising our children. In Proverbs 19.18, the Bible says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. So it's saying, look, first you've got to do it while there's hope, because there's going to be a point where you're not going to be able to discipline that child anymore. You have to do it while there's still hope. You have to start early, because as, as soon as they get old enough, you, it's too late. You've already passed the point of even being able to discipline them and correct them properly. And it also says, let not thy soul spare, so don't hold back. Don't hold back your correction and disciplining them just because they start crying. I'll tell you what, if I spared from, from, from spanking my children, yes, I spank my children. I spank them with the rod, as the Bible says, and we're going to read in a minute. If I stopped the second that they cried, they wouldn't be getting very much discipline at all. Because I'll tell you what, the minute that you even, you even show, let them know that they're going to get spanked, they start crying. So if my soul spared for that, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be getting disciplined. They wouldn't be getting disciplined properly. You have to understand that to a child, I mean, their emotions can run wild, and they see it, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's scary. Thing. Oh, man, I don't want to get spanked, and they start crying. But you're not, I mean, as long as you're obviously, as long as you're not injuring them, which you shouldn't be anyways, that's not proper discipline. I'm not talking about just, you know, beating them up. To, you know, and, and just and and you know, 
They're hurting them, injuring them. I'm just talking about correcting them, giving them a, a, a stinging sensation on their rear ends to know that what they did was wrong. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 13, it gets a lot more clear about this. It says, withhold not correction from the child. Again, it's just not sparing. Don't withhold that correction. They need it. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Say, look, they're not going to die. You need to inflict, you need to inflict some pain. They're not going to die. Beat him with the rod. It says, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. There's not much room for interpretation on how we're supposed to be disciplining our kids in that, in that context. Okay, now, that word beat has a negative connotation today, and we tend to use that word beat for other things. I mean, you think about the beating of Rodney King or something. That's not what the Bible's talking about in this verse. Okay, you have to be able to understand the words that are used in the Bible in complete context, and when you look at it in all of the scripture, that's not, it's not talking about that type of a beating. Okay, but um, it's still very clear that you need, you need to be spanking your children. And, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with using the rod to do that. And the Bible actually says to do that in order to deliver their soul from hell. Now, how serious is that? I mean, I, I can't think of anything else in the world. Like, I, I, I have concern and, and just I, I hope and pray that my children all grow up and be saved. I mean, that's like one of the worst things I think that could happen for a parent is to know, like, like to have a child that's lost and that's not saved that's going to spend an eternity in hell. Like, because you love them so much. I mean, the last thing you want for your own children is for them to go to hell. And, um, but the Bible gives you one of the ways here to deliver their soul from hell. Obviously, they need to get saved and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's saying, look, you need to teach them. And, and here's the thing. And this is one of the big reasons why it's so important. Why is it important to actually do the spanking? Because... They're going to learn that there is a consequence, a very, very, very unpleasant consequence for their actions. It's not just sitting down in a chair and facing a wall. Okay? They're going to experience some kind of a pain as a result, as a consequence of their actions, which in reality, God has a punishment that is a consequence for our actions on this earth when we sin. And it's even worse than a spanking because it's an eternity of burning and being tortured and tormented in hell. You start from that young age of learning, hey, when I do wrong, when I break the commandments, when I break mom and dad's rules, there's a consequence for that. And, it's, and it hurts. It doesn't feel good. It's not pleasant at all. And I don't want to have that happen again. When we break God's commandments, we break God's rules, he's got a consequence for that. And this is something, this is, this is why I firmly believe that this is even in here saying that you shall deliver their soul from hell because they'll understand that concept of having um, a consequence for your actions. Whereas lots of kids who don't get that discipline, they never learn that. They never understand that there really are consequences for your actions. I had a friend growing up whose parents enabled him to do all these bad things. He never got in trouble. He never, like, he was doing wrong and doing wrong. And this guy, I mean, it started off with drinking. And he was one of my friends. He was, he was actually one of my better friends. Started off with drinking. And because his brother was a firefighter, you know, anytime he got pulled over in town by the cops, they knew his brother, so they would just bring him home, you know, and, and, and his parents wouldn't do anything about it. He'd end up stealing from his parents to, you know, because he started getting into drugs and started stealing from his parents to support his habit, and they didn't do anything about it. I mean, there was one night he got pulled over by the cops three times in one night. Three times in the same night. He kept going back out and going on the road and just nothing happened. Didn't spend any time in jail, and you know, nothing. The, the guy ended up being a crackhead and just living on the street. And I don't even know, I don't, to this day, I don't even know if he's alive. I don't know anything about him anymore because he just, he just you know, and his, we tried to help him. We tried to just tell him, look, man, you got you to gotta get a hold of yourself. Get, but, the, you know, when you have no consequences, when nothing happens as a result of your actions and you just can continue on doing and doing, you know, doing wrong, why would you ever think that anything's going to happen to you? You're just going to keep going through life without, without, without knowing about that. Start early. Start with the children. Let them know, hey, look, you do wrong, you do bad, there's going to be bad things that are going to happen to you. It's going to, and, and it's true. You don't want to learn that later after it's too late. Or it's too late to learn that lesson. And, you know, oftentimes, this is exactly what can happen with us and God, too. Now, 
you, if you're saved, you already know you're not going to hell, right? But the Bible also does say that, that you know, whatsoever man shall sow, that shall also reap. So, like, when we continue in sin and are doing wrong, we will have consequences to face. Now, it won't be an eternity in hell, but God will make us reap what we sow. I mean, just by our sin, it's going to come back to us. And when we lose our proper respect for God, which is exactly what happens with, with children, you, know, you lose your respect, you don't have that respect and that fear of God, you start treating with them casually as you would, say, with a friend instead of as you would with a father. That's when it's really easy to, to, to start getting into sins and not even worrying about it, not thinking about it, because you're treating it, you're treating God, you're treating Jesus just as a friend and not as a father. <clears throat> now, God has a very loving relationship with us, very long suffering and kind. And you know what? I'm very long suffering and kind with my children as well. I love them. I do a lot of things for them. I bless them. But you know what? I'm still their parents and I expect, yeah, I demand that type of respect from them towards me as their father. We're not friends. Those girls over there are not my friends. They're my children. And I love them and I do a lot of things for them and we have a lot of fun together. But they're still my children and they respect me. And they give me the authority that, that I, you know, they respect the authority that I have over their lives as their father. And it's the same thing with their mother. And one of the reasons why they have that respect for us, though, is because of the discipline that they receive. And it's extremely important to start young. <clears throat> now, it's also important to note here that you can't expect a child to understand why you have the rules for them. They simply have to learn to obey the rules. Okay? They're going to get the why part later. They have to start off with just obeying. Because they're, you know, oftentimes their young minds are not, they're not going to be able to comprehend the importance of why, why do you even have this rule? And, and just come up with it on their own and just say, well, <coughs> since I don't know why I have to do this, I'm just going to do my own thing in disregard. No. They have to learn to obey first. And then later on, that understanding comes the same way with God. You might not understand why the Bible might say a certain thing. You might not understand it. And say, why in the world does God care? I mean, people say, like, why in the world does God care about the length of my hair? And he says in 1 Corinthians, it says, you know, that's a shame for a man to have long hair. Why, why, does he, why does God even care about that? It doesn't matter necessarily why God cares about that. You just need to obey that. Why, can't, why, is, it, why is it wrong for a woman to, to speak in the church? Well, first you just need to obey it. You know what? The understanding will come later. The understanding comes. I mean, there's a lot of things that I didn't understand in the Bible that now I do understand. It'll come later, but God expects you to be obedient first. <clears throat> the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1 7. We need to obey Him first. When we have that fear of the Lord and obey His commandments, hey, that's the beginning of knowledge. Then you're going to be able to start to understand. Then you're going to be able to grow and learn why you do all these things. And it's the same way with, I mean, faith in Jesus Christ. you gotta, you got to accept them by faith. Later on, it's going to be realized. Later on, we'll see for sure, and there's you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that um, you know, when we actually get our new, our new bodies and stuff, right now we have to take it on faith. We need to have that fear of God, understand that He is all-powerful, He is our Father, and He has rules for us, and have that, that respect. See, fear and respect go hand in hand. We need to have that fear of God, knowing that he can, he can do whatever to us. And, you know, the Bible says that perfect love casteth out fear. But I don't know, does anyone here have a perfect love of God? I mean, I know I don't. I need to still have that fear of God. I mean, if I had a perfect love of God, I, I, I wouldn't sin. If it was perfect. And then, and then if I wasn't sinning, I wouldn't even have to fear God. Because what would be the point? There's no reason for God to discipline me at all. Um, but I don't. I'm not perfect. I'm not sinless. I don't have a. I, I need to retain that fear of God. Um, now, honor doesn't always mean respect. Go ahead and turn, if you would, to uh, Mark chapter number seven. I'm going to show you where it, it's mostly talking about respect when you give honor and reverence to people. You know, honoring your father and mother will be giving them honor, giving them respect treating them with the respect that they deserve as parents. 
But it's not always necessarily talking just about respect. And, and again, a lot of these, a lot of the meanings of the word, I mean, they, they, they kind of, they all go together, but it just gives a little bit of a, of a reason why it's being used. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'm going to read this for you, in verse 17, see, sometimes honor means like taking care of them financially as well, not just a respect as in like, like mentally just giving them respect with your words, but also taking care of your parents. In um in 1 Timothy 5.17, the Bible says, let the elders, so the elder is like a, um, a pastor or a preacher of the, you know, of the church. It says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So you got pastors, they labor in the word and doctrine. You know, they're doing a lot of good work. It says, let them be counted worthy of double honor. Now, it explains what that means in the next verse. Verse 18 says, for the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. So he's likening that to, you know, an animal. They used to use oxen to tread the corn to grind them to powder. And they would use it, and they're saying, don't muzzle the ox. Let him eat of what he's doing. You know, let him eat the corn while he's trampling it out. He's doing all that work. Don't muzzle him up and not allow him to eat. And then it says, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So there, when it's talking about the double honor, it's talking about taking care of the pastor, like you could say financially or physically, like making sure his needs are taken care of. And it says he's you know, one that rules well, one that does a lot of work. Hey, he's worthy of double honor. Take care of him well. You know, he's doing a hard work. He's doing a good job. Take care of him well. So, and, and the reason why I bring that up is because this isn't about pastors, but it's just that word honor can, is, is not only used in just respect, but, I mean, but it is, it's still respect because part of that respect is then showing that respect and showing that love and showing that reverence by taking care of them. And we see that in Mark chapter 7 because the following, you know, the, the Mark chapter 7 is not talking about, you know, like young children just obeying their parents. This is talking to adults. Mark 7 verse 10, the Bible says, this is Jesus Christ speaking, he said, for Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother. So this is, the exact, this is the commandment that we're looking at, right? Honor thy father and mother. And whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Those are two separate commandments. We're going to get into the second one a little bit. And then he goes on further. He says, but ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So he's saying, look, he's rebuking them because what they did was they were saying, if, if any man has a father or mother and, and, and the, the child would say to their parents, hey, whatever, whatever it is that I give for you, just you, you count that as a gift. That's not something that they deserve. Or that is owed to them. He said, no, that's a, that's a gift. Whatever I do for you that you can be profited by, that's a gift. And Jesus Christ rebuked them. And he said, look. And, and he says, you suffer him to no more do aught. So it means like you're not even allowing him. Basically, he said, you make the word of God of none effect. He's saying, my commandments, the, the commandments of God, you just made it of none effect. God commanded to honor thy father and thy mother. And by just saying, well, hey, whatever I do for you is a gift. You've just, you've just negated God's word and just made it of none effect because they've had this tradition of, of saying, oh, well, you're, count, you're, you're lucky if I help you out. When the Bible, is, what he's teaching here is that, no, you need to be taking care of your parents, you know, especially as they get older. They're not unable to work. They're you know, unable to maybe provide for themselves. It's every, I mean, it's everybody's responsibility, every child, all the children's responsibility to take care of their parents. The parents start off with taking care of you when you're a child or when you're young. And then as you get older, if you're not able to take care of it, you know, honoring your father and mother, it's not just giving them respect, but it's giving them the respect enough to the point to where you're going to be able to take care of them and help them out and do whatever it is, whatever you can do to, to honor them and to, and to take care of them. Um, and we, I preached about widows not too long ago. It's a, it's a similar type of thing where... The church isn't held responsible for taking care of the widows unless they have no family to take care of them whatsoever. See, God has developed this family structure. 
And the family ought to be close and knit together and be able to um, help one another out. And you do it because you're family. I mean, you take care of your parents because they're your parents. Even if you have difference of opinion or you don't like something or whatever and you, and you, know, you have a bad relationship, I still believe that you ought to take care of your parents. When they're needed, you, have to, you ought to take care of them because they're your parents. And um, now I'm going to look at real quickly, it says, Whoso curseth father or mother, Jesus said this, let him die the death. So this is not only talking about honoring them, but if you actually go the exact opposite way, instead of honoring them, respecting them, reverencing them, you actually curse your parents. The Bible says in Exodus 21, 17, And he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Leviticus 20, verse 9 says, For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon him. And Proverbs 20, 20 says, Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. The Bible treats this very, very, very seriously. This is not just, you know, some light thing with God. This, this idea of reverencing and respecting your parents because he says if you do the opposite, if you curse them, you know, you tell your parents to go to hell, you just like curse them. And um, he says you deserve to be put to death. That's a death penalty punishment on that. And what happens is when you get a family structure, the family structure that God has designed, when that starts to break down and people... You know, because of sin or whatever, people start doing things not the way God has designed. You start getting an extremely wicked society and it starts infecting the whole society. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, verse 11, it says, There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. And I believe this is the generation that we're living in right now. It says, There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. So they think that everything they do is, is good and right. There's a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. It's a proud attitude. You know, one who, who gives no respect to their parents, they're proud, they're lifted up in themselves. It says there's a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. It's a, it's a self-righteous it's a, it's a proud, haughty attitude that people get. And the people that have that type of attitude, it's, as, you know, I mean, it's, it's the same generation that curses their father and they don't bless their parents. It's me, 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 me. They don't care about their family. They don't care about the poor. They don't care about anyone else but themselves. They don't care about Jesus Christ and the gift that he has. They think they're going to do it themselves. This is the type of generation we're living. And, and when you get that, I mean, that's a wicked, a wicked mindset to have. And other sins just, just fall into place naturally when, when people have that type of attitude, that mindset. And I'm, I'm not going to go into this too much, but it's, I'm just going to point out real quick. I talked about, I had a sermon about reprobates last week. Romans 1 gives all these um, attributes of people who are rep reprobate. It says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, and then disobedient to parents is thrown in there. It's just one more thing. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it also talks about the same thing. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, right? Just what we saw in Proverbs. Lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, again, having a prideful attitude, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. So again, it throws that in there, disobedient to parents, along all of these other really bad things that, that are attributes of them. Um, I'm not going to get into this story. I was going to go, I was gonna go to, to um, tell a story about Jesus Christ, because even Jesus Christ, he was a perfect example for everything. And even Jesus was subject to his own parents. Now let's go over the story. We're not going to read the whole scripture, but um, when Jesus was a boy, when he was 12 years old, his parents took him to Jerusalem, right? And then he ended up um, going into the temple and he was talking with the doctors and the lawyers and they were amazed at, at, at his understanding and just like, like, wow, like this is a 12 year old, you know? And he was talking with them and, and they were amazed at, at, at how smart he was and how wise he was. And um, his parents ended up leaving and they, they thought that he was in the crowd with some other family members or whatever and they started leaving. And then they come back and it says, um, you know, they're just like, 
you know, what are you doing? And he's like, how is it that you sought me, wishing out that I must be about my father's business? But it also says in verse 51, it says, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. So he says, you know, he was doing his father's business when he was in the temple and he was, you know, teaching and, be, and, and, and talking and, and having these discussions with people. He was doing the, the, the business of his father. Yet, even though he was doing those things, when his parents came back and said, you got to come with us, we're going back home, he was subject to him. He obeyed him. He listened to him. As a, as a child should. He was, he was a human being still. Even though he's God in the flesh, he was still a human being, and he, and he obeyed and was subject under the authority of his parents. He gave that proper respect. And the reason why this respect is so important is because this is the exact same respect that we ought to have for God. You need to learn that respect in the home for your own parents. And it's a symbol, too. I mean, the, the respect that you give your parents should mirror, you know, the, the respect that we give God. Uh, and, 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 you know, God has given authority over parents in the household the same way that he's our father when we're born again. We're born into his family. Um, turn to Ephesians 5, if you would. I'm going to wrap things up here real quick and just kind of wrap up with, a, with God's plan for a family. Because a family is under attack today. By, uh, on all fronts. There's divorce. We've got a lot of single parents. You know, the man is no longer the head of the household. It's just kind of split authority. You've got the woman going to work. You know, the children are ended up being disrespectful. That You know, there's not a proper discipline in place. All these things are going on to destroy the family. Because the family should be the core. I mean, that should be the source of for the children to grow up in an environment where they're learning and they're being loved and they're being taught, right? From, I mean, the main teaching ought to be being come from the family. Then you don't have to rely on anybody else. And if you have a solid family, then you have solid, you know, Christians, you have solid people growing up. You don't have to rely on anyone else. And this is the way that God designed it. If we could just follow God's design of the family, I mean, so many more things would just would, would be easier to fall in place. And here's God's design for the family. If you're in Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start reading in verse 22. The Bible says, wives, so again, I mean, the family obviously is, is, is a married, you know, husband and wife, right? That's a family. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. God's plan is for the wife to be submissive to the husband, it said, and, it, and it goes on to say, as unto the Lord. So how submissive do you think we ought to be to God? <coughs> if God tells you to do something, if God has a commandment for you to do, how submissive should we be to that? We, we ought to just do it without question. We ought to do that. That is the submissive role that we play from God. And the, the Bible saying, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife. He's giving the authority structure right here. You have the husband at the top of the, that family and um, the wife underneath. It says, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. So this church, who is our head? It's not me. It's Jesus Christ. He is the head of this church. He's the one that gives the rules. He's the one leading and directing and guiding and giving us our marching orders are giving us the wisdom. And we have, of course, Jesus Christ through the word of God. And then it says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, as we are supposed, I mean, we ought to be, we ought to be subject below, you know, that sub is like a, you know, a sub level is, is, is something that's below. Subject is something that's, that's below Christ in authority. So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. It doesn't even say in something. It says in everything. Let the wives be subject unto their own husbands in everything. Now, now he's going to tell us the husband's roles. Yes, the wife's role. They're supposed to be, they're supposed to be submissive. The, 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 the husband, I'm sorry, I might have just misspoke. The wife's role is supposed to be submissive. The husband's role is that he's the head of the household, and he's the one that's in charge and gives the rules. But now the husband's role here, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So the husband, look, you're not just some mean you know, dictator that's just serve me, serve me, serve me, serve me, serve me, serve me, serve me. That's not the point of the, of the wife being submissive. You're supposed to love your wife 
Even as it says, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ loved the church so much, he gave up his body. He did everything. He worked hard. He was up night. He was up days. He was working with his hands. He was out talking to people, preaching the gospel, and just doing what was right no matter what. He put everybody else first. He put himself last. He allowed himself to suffer shame. He allowed himself to suffer a beating. He said, you know, the, the crucifixion on the cross. He gave his own life for the church. That is the love that the husband ought to have for his wife. A selflessness to be able to give up even himself and, and die for his wife. That's the love that the husband ought to have for his wife. Now I realize that there are problems in marriages with wives and husbands not fulfilling their role. But I'll tell you what, if one of, let's say, let's say you're a husband and your wife, you say, my wife isn't submitting to me. She's not in her role. Well, you better still love your wife because that's what's commanded for you. That is what your role is. You better not shirk on, on loving your wife at all because she's not in her proper role. You better do what your job is no matter what. And, and you know, that'll have to be between her and God. Now, if you're leading and doing a good job of loving your wife, then there shouldn't be a reason why your wife wouldn't want to be submissive to you as well if you're doing a good enough job with that. And it's the same goes the same way for the wives. Say, well, I'm not going to listen to what my husband says because he doesn't really love me that much. That's not what the Bible says. That's wickedness and that's sin. You need to just fall into your proper role. God has it designed for a reason. And, um, and this is the way he ordained it. And it says in verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Again, it's talking back about the church, about Jesus Christ giving himself for it, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. So, I mean, husbands, you better be out working and working hard to, to nourish your wife. I mean, physically with food and also with the Bible and with the word of God. You know, nourish her with God's word. Be the spiritual leader of the house and, and you know, do all that you can to support your family. And the support. I mean, it's, this is very clear what God's teaching us how the family ought to be designed. And if it were designed this way, and we're getting to the children in, in chapter 6, but you notice here too, it says for we, in verse 30 of Ephesians 5, it says, For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So again, God's perfect example here of how things ought to be is that a man grows up in his family, and then the only time he leaves his family is when he's leaving father and mother to cleave unto his wife and then start his own family. So you're going from family to family. There is no in-between time. See, this world has a, has a system set up where the child turns 18 and they're out the door and they go to college, they go whatever, they get their own place and they, you know, in most, most cases are going to be getting into all kinds of wickedness and sin and committing fornication and just doing all these things because, hey, there's no more authority structure in the house and there's no liability, there's no responsibility, it's just you and just go out and do whatever you want. And when, especially when they're 18 years old, I mean, you're a kid. I'm sorry, you may be, a, you may be an adult, you may be a man, you know, but, but you're very, very young, and I still, I mean, that's still a kid. There's still a lot of learning, a lot of knowledge that needs to happen. And th when you cleave to a wife, well, hey, now you have some kind of responsibility. Now there's someone else that you need to be concerned about, and there's accountability for the things that you do. You can't just go out and sleep around and do whatever you want when you got a wife at home. There's going to be someone there, another person in your household to help keep you in check so that you don't go crazy getting, getting off into sin yourself. And God designed it this way for a reason. That's why he says you leave your father and mother cleave on your wife. This is God's design, okay? We know that things aren't perfect in this world today. There's all kinds of situations out there where people are, are all screwed up, but this is the way that God planned it. It says... Um, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. <laughs> Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. And see, this is all in, in addition to just being what's right for us. It's a picture of, of God and Christ and the church. And um, you're dishonoring God when you don't fall into your proper role as husband or wife. 
And then in Ephesians 6, it gives the role of the children. In Ephesians 6, 1, we're going to be wrapping it up here. I'm almost done. Ephesians 6, verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. We went over that earlier. That it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. So children, the Bible is telling you, you need to obey your parents. Whatever they say for you to do, you just better do it. Okay? And it says, and then it says in verse 4, like this too, it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay, so, the, you know, dads have a tendency, maybe there's um, a lack of compassion sometimes from the father. Um, men aren't quite as emotional as, as, as the mothers are. And sometimes you can, you can come off as just, as being a real hard, tough guy, which nothing wrong with being strict on the rules and, and, and you know, laying down the law when you need to, but you shouldn't be provoking your children to wrath. Like you shouldn't just be just just making them angry and just kind of driving things in with them and just just to just to, to rouse them up and get them angry because you can. The Bible says to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know, you still ought to be nurturing your children. And um, and don't just don't just get them to the point where you just you're just making them angry. Um, that's the way you know the father should be bringing it up. And, and the kids, I mean, hey, if you're if you're a child and maybe maybe neither of your parents are falling into their roles, the Bible still says to obey your parents. And the thing is, there's a good reason for this. What it does is that shows you, a, it, it basically it shows a great testimony through your life. When you believe the Bible and you believe God's word, that, I mean, it might, it's not going to happen overnight, but the, your other family members, it can have an impact. When you start doing things the way the Bible says, regardless of what everyone else is doing, and you say, you know what, my wife is a submissive, but you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to love her, and I'm going to I'm going to love her more, I'm going to love her as much as Christ loved the church, and you just start doing that, you know what? It might take some time, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to sink in. She'll start to notice that. When you start living that way, she'll start to notice that. And, and that could very well could prompt change on her end, too. Well, if you continue to do things for her and you continue to love her and, you know, and give yourself and work hard and do all these things for her, well, you might start to realize, hey, Men want respect. I mean, that's that's one of the basic things as a man. You want respect. You want to just, when, when you talk to someone, you just want to be treated with respect. You don't want to be disrespected. And when the wife is being obedient, it's very respectful. And, um, and you know, men, a lot of men don't typically ask much. I know I don't, I don't I like to think that I don't. I don't know. <laughs> but um, but if one thing you can do if you respect the man, then... Um, you know that's what they're looking for, and, and and your marriage will go well, and it's gonna it's gonna go well with you when you're when you're conforming to God's word, and you're making the changes necessary, and doing what's right, and um, you know these, as we saw in Ephesians five, these commandments regarding the family structure show us a lot of great truths about God and His relationship with us. I mean, God being our Father. The Bible also um, talks about the church being the bride of Christ. So again, if the church is the bride. That's why the church is submissive unto Christ, just like the, the and, you know, physically the, the wife ought to be submissive to her husband because um, God uses these to help us to understand um, our place and our, and our roles and the structure and the way God has things set up. And he uses worldly examples of like a husband and a wife to also give us truth about how we ought to treat him and vice versa, the way that we treat God is is oftentimes should be reflected in our own personal lives, and um, you know it's, I haven't heard very many sermons on, on honoring your father and mother, but I do think it's important. I mean, we saw what Jesus said that um, he was talking to adults. It's not just for children. It's not just a verse talking about children, you know, obeying their parents, which it is. I mean, it's talking about that. You ought to honor your, your father and mother, but even as adults, hey, give your give your parents respect. They brought you in. You're still alive today. I mean, they kept you. They nourished you up to the, you know to the point where you are now. And um, and and maybe not everyone has the best parents, but the Bible says to honor your father and mother. And 
you might have to find some kind of forgiveness, but hey, that's um, uh, think about the forgiveness that Jesus Christ had for you, that, 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 that your Father in Heaven had for you. You might have to swallow some pride, but it's important to be able to honor your Father and your Mother. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so. I thank you for your commandments, dear God. I, I love your commandments. I, I'm glad that you tell us how the best way is to live and, and how we ought to live. And um, and I realize that they're commandments, dear God, and that that we're really expected to, to follow them, and you command us to. It's not a suggestion. It's not just. Um, well, this is the, the preferred way. I know it's a commandment, dear God, but I love them. And I thank you for showing us this truth. And um, would to God that we can just put these, these truths into place in our life. And I know that we would experience so much more joy and would be more fulfilled just, just walking in your word and being closer to you and having a better relationship with you as our Father when we can just simply obey the commandments that you've laid out for us so that we don't have to be chastened, dear Lord. And... Um, I love you for the Bible. I love you for your word. And I pray that you would please just help us all to walk away with something today. And, um, and maybe it's a, a start living with more respect towards other people in general. Help us to bring back some of these you know, traditions that are based on the Bible where, where we rise up before the hoary head, as the Bible says that we ought to do, and show respect unto the, unto the older people and to, um, and to this people in general to, to get um, determined and get more manners. And treat people respectfully, dear Lord, and, um, and to honor our parents. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.